Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Welcome back to the Sound Bites Podcast. I want to tell you a little bit about today's episode and a couple of other announcements before we jump into the actual interview. So, my guest today is Dr. Glenn Gazer, and I actually saw him present at Fency. Well, it was before it was Fency, it was over 20 years ago in 1997. It was called the American Dietetic Association Annual Meeting. And his topic was fit at any size, helping large people start and stay with exercise. Now, how do I know this? Do I have this incredible memory? No, I was actually going through some files and cleaning out some files and I came across his handout. So if you're a health at any size supporter, you know, we've been talking about this for decades. It's nothing new, but it's very important. So Glenn is an exercise physiologist and the author of a new study that was just published in the journal, Advances in Nutrition. The study is titled, Refined Grains and Health, Genuine Risk or Guilt by Association. So he and I are talking today about whether refined grains cause or increase your risk for diabetes and other chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, stroke, hypertension, cancer, Now, in this episode, we focus mostly on type 2 diabetes, but his study did look at all of these chronic diseases. We're discussing what the research really says about whole grains, refined grains, and indulgent grains. And Dr. Gazer shares some helpful recommendations for grain intake that are notably different than the make half your grains whole recommendation that we are familiar with. So speaking of diabetes, I am really excited to share with you. I recently got back from a board leadership retreat in Jersey City. I am the new incoming marketing and communications chair on the Diabetes Care and Education DPG Dietetic Practice Group of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So I met some awesome people We have a lot of great things going on in the DCE DPG that I will keep you posted about. And I'm just really excited to be working with these diabetes educators and the fun and exciting work that we're going to be doing. Speaking of Jersey, since I was just there, I was also recently on the Nutrition Nuptials podcast with Mandy and Taco. So my husband and I were on this double date podcast episode. And if you're familiar with Mandy and Wright and the Nutrition Nuptials podcast. She's based on the Jersey Shore. So that's why I had this little Jersey connection here. But anyway, my husband and I were on there doing our double date. So if you want some inside scoop on how we met on eHarmony after we were both divorced, uh, you can get all the details in the Nutrition Nuptials podcast. One more quick update. If you're familiar with the Family Dinner Project, it's actually one of my favorite resources in my Do More With Dinner resource kit that you can get for free on my website at soundbitesrd.com. Well, the Family Dinner Project has some updates and some news. They recently did a website makeover. So I encourage you to go over there and check it out at thefamilydinnerproject.org. They have a new food section, a fresh look for the conversation section, and updates on their fun section. So there's just some really cool new tools and resources. As you know, I'm partnering with the American Association of Diabetes Educators, and I have one quick update. So I'm just going to share it here instead of at the end. So there's a new non-medical switching toolkit for healthcare professionals to help you work with patients. That link is at diabeteseducator.org forward slash non-medical switching. Now, what is non-medical switching? Forced non-medical switching is the practice in which insurers force an individual to change medications for reasons other than their health and safety. It happens when either the person's current medication is removed from the payer's formulary or the payer increases the out-of-pocket costs so that the medication becomes unaffordable. 
So like I said, healthcare professionals can help patients understand their rights and the options they have when non-medical switching happens by going to this new resource from AADE. Okay, that's it. Please enjoy today's episode. Hello, and welcome back to the Sound Bites Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Joy Dobbins. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist. And on the show, we delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. And today we're going to be refining the conversation on grains, if you will. We're going to be talking about grains and health, but specifically refined and enriched grains and the risk for diabetes and other chronic health conditions. My guest today is Dr. Glenn Gazer. He's a professor in the College of Health Solutions at Arizona State University, and he's had prior academic appointments at the University of Virginia and UCLA. A fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine, Dr. Gazer's research focuses on the effects of exercise and diet on cardiovascular fitness and health, and his work has been published in scientific journals. He's also a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Grain Foods Foundation, where he helps oversee the scientific accuracy of Grain Food Foundation's research and nutrition education programming on the role of grains in a well-balanced eating pattern. Welcome to the show, Dr. Gazer. Oh, thank you for having me. Looking forward to our discussion today. Now, this episode is not sponsored by the Grain Foods Foundation, but I did see you present at a sponsored conference in Toronto and was thrilled to hear a discussion about grains and diabetes. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about your role on the Scientific Advisory Board? Sure. I have been on the Scientific Advisory Board for the Grain Foods Foundation for 15 years. It was uh, actually started in 2004, and I was asked at the president of the uh, GFF at that time if I would like to be a member of the Scientific Advisory Board, and I agreed and have been on ever since. And I, along with other members of the board, essentially are there to try to make sense of the science that is continually being published with respect to the health benefits of grain foods. So, for example, you know, the popularity of various diets go up and down over time, the low carb and uh, glycemic index and gluten-free, paleo and keto and so forth. Many of them take a very decidedly negative view of not just refined grains, but oftentimes just whole grains themselves, the entire grain category. So we try to dispel some of the myths associated with uh, some of these claims and try to stick to the science to see what the science actually shows. So my role is basically to kind of make sure that science is always being interrogated to the point where we kind of have a good sense of where we are in terms of what's fact and what is not. Excellent. Well, as you know, a new study was published in April in Advances in Nutrition, which of course is a peer-reviewed medical journal from the American Society of Nutrition, and it boldly substantiates that refined grains have gotten a bad rap. And we're going to dig into the science here, and you're going to explain why you were interested in researching this topic and what you saw in the research and what this paper discusses. But As we go through, we're going to be talking about refined grains, whole grains, enriched grains. And so maybe a good place to start is to talk about what are refined grains. You know, they're not just staple foods like bread, rice, cereal, and pasta, but you also got to throw in the cookies, cakes, donuts, brownies, and so on. And you're going to talk about how the research gets a little confusing because all these foods are kind of grouped together and they're really not all created equal. So tell us why you were interested in researching this. Well, I'm always interested in science and the perception of science. So whether or not the conventional wisdom actually is consistent with what the scientific evidence shows. So that's always been a passion of mine, and it doesn't relate just to the refined grains, but a number of other issues with regard to exercise and health and diet and so forth and obesity. But with regard to grains, I was really interested in why refined grains were so disparaged. The dietary guidelines that the United States has put out every five years 
seems to always label refined grains as something bad, something we need to avoid because it's associated with health problems. And that always struck me as kind of odd because I myself have always consumed lots of grain foods ever since I was a kid. And I knew a lot of other people that consume grain foods, and it didn't seem to be associated with, uh, at least overtly, with poor health. So I decided to just take a deeper dive into the research on this and try to decipher whether or not the refined grains equals bad health is fact or fiction. Mm -hmm. You know, we get into these food mantras, and I think sometimes there's some oversimplification. Uh, Well, there's a lot of places where the research and the communication can kind of break down. So tell us about the study. And, you know, we might have to explain a few terms like meta-analysis and cohorts and things like that. But tell us about the study, and then we can kind of dig from there. Okay. Well, really, I have to go back about five years. In 2015, I actually provided some oral comments to the U.S. Dietary Guidelines uh, Committee that was basically looking at the uh, guidelines as they were going to be presented that year. And I noticed that they had, again, at that time in 2015, labeled refined grains as something to be avoided. So my preliminary effort at research in the science at that time indicated that I thought something was amiss. So after the guidelines came out, and again, basically painting refined grains as something bad uh, and something to be avoided, I decided to do a deeper dive. So about a year ago or so, I started to really research intently what was going on with that literature. And so I decided to take a look at the literature that was used to present refined grains in a bad way, and then some alternative viewpoints that I felt better represented the association between refined grains and health. So one of the major problems we have with the current research in terms of foods and health is that most of the research and the information that the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee relies on is based upon dietary patterns. And what is meant by a dietary pattern is a pattern of eating that seems to consist of a lot of certain types of foods. So to be more specific, there is a dietary pattern that has been associated with poor health outcomes repeatedly in study after study, they show quite consistently that that a Western dietary pattern is associated with increased risk of premature death, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, and so forth. Then you take a look at what is in this dietary pattern and you find that it's red meat, processed meat, high-fat dairy, sugar-sweetened foods and beverages, French fries, and refined grains. So I asked the question to myself, well, how do they know that all the elements in that dietary pattern are equally culpable in terms of poor health? And the only way to resolve that issue is to take a look at the studies that have been published in which refined grains have been basically assessed independently of those other food in that Western dietary pattern. And that is what I did. And that is the essence of the paper to which you alluded to that was published just this last month in um, the advances in nutrition. So that makes a lot of sense. You know, you want to kind of see, okay, we've lumped all these things together. So that's the dietary pattern aspect. But if we look at the food group more specifically, and what the research there shows. So tell us what you found. Yes. So I went through a lit search using Web of Science and PubMed with key terms such as refined grains and refined grain intake and various health outcomes. And I tried to specifically focus on the diseases and health conditions that the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee report had focused on. And those are more specifically type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. With regard to those three conditions, they felt there was moderate to strong evidence that refined grain intake was associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. So I essentially tried to look at studies that had been published focusing only on the refined grains and their contribution to these diseases. So I tried to get as much of the research as possible from what are known as meta-analyses. 
And probably the easiest way to describe a meta-analysis is that it's a statistical procedure that combines results from lots of different scientific studies. So, for example, you may hear in the uh, media one day that a certain food item is associated with increased risk, like eating French fries is associated with increased risk of heart disease. And increased consumption of saturated fats is associated with increased risk of stroke. And then you hear a study that says, no, just the opposite. Eggs are good. Eggs are bad. Grains are good. Grains are bad. So you have to wonder which one of these studies is right because there is so much conflicting evidence. And so one of the advantages of meta-analyses is that the researchers take a look at all the relevant studies that have been published and basically combine them into one big giant analysis. And so it kind of gives you a better view of what all of the science says and not just any one particular study. So that's the strength of the meta-analysis, and that is what I focused on. So what I found was that there were 11 meta-analyses that had been published that included a total of about 32 different separate publications with data from about 24 distinct cohorts. And a cohort is just a large population of people that are followed over time. And so when you put all this together, the meta-analyses kind of showed a very distinct and uh, consistent finding with respect to refined grains and health. They were not associated with any increased risk of any of those diseases. It was pretty much a flat line. There was no adverse association whatsoever. And we can maybe circle back on the limitations of a meta-analysis or meta-analyses, but I have a quick question. With the refined grains in in all these research studies that, that you looked back at, the laundry list that I read earlier, you know, it's not just bread, rice, cereal, pasta, but also cookies, cakes. Those were all still grouped together in that sense. Is that correct? Yeah. So that's even getting a little bit more granular in terms of the science there. So for example, let me just take diabetes. This is a very good example, and you can do the same thing for cardiovascular disease as well. But for type 2 diabetes, I found two meta-analyses that had been published on the relationship between refined grain intake and diabetes risk. And so these are in populations of people who don't really have diabetes at the beginning of the study, but then develop it over time as they are followed up. And the researchers see whether or not the uh, risk of developing diabetes was dependent upon or associated with their intake of refined grains at, uh, that was documented at the start of the study. So in those two meta-analyses, there were you know, 12 different publications from different cohorts. And all of the papers within the two meta-analyses showed no association between refined grain intake and uh, diabetes risk. And the way they assess this is that, for example, let's just take a typical cohort that might have 50 or 100,000 men and women in it, and their dietary intake patterns are assessed, and then they're followed up over time, and the researchers see whether or not the individuals develop diabetes or not. And so what you have here is a couple ways you can analyze it. One, you can take a look at individuals that have the highest intake of refined grains and compare them to the individuals that have the lowest intake of refined grains. So if refined grain intake is bad, in other words, refined grain intake would tend to increase your risk of diabetes, you would expect that the high consumers of refined grains, those in the highest intake categories of refined grains, would have a higher risk of developing diabetes compared to those that basically hardly ever ate refined grains. And the results of the two meta-analyses indicate there is no association whatsoever. So individuals that consumed, let's say, only maybe one serving a day on average of refined grains You compare those to individuals that were consuming maybe five or six or even seven servings a day of refined grains. That's a huge difference in refined grain intake. And you found absolutely no increased risk of diabetes. So uh, this just shows quite clearly that refined grain intake is not associated with increased risk of diabetes. Mm -hmm. And then you have to ask the question, well, what? constitutes a refined grain. And this becomes 
problematic because when I looked at the method sections of each of the individual papers included in the meta-analysis, I found that, well, we have a problem here because not only were staple grain foods such as breads and cereals and pastas and so forth, those staple grain foods, not only were they included in the definition of refined grain, but you also had things like cookies Cakes, donuts, brownies, muffins, sweet rolls, sweet desserts made with grains, and pizza, including the toppings. Mm. So you have this large collection of foods that are defined as refined grains, but I don't think there's anyone that would consider the potential health effects of, let's say, a cereal or a pasta or a piece of bread to be the same as a cookie or a a donut or a sweet roll. And yet this is how they are defined. So the lack of any association between refined grain intake and diabetes may actually be distorted somewhat by the inclusion of staple and indulgent grain foods in the same definition. So, you know, you could ask the question, well, what would happen if you removed all those indulgent grains from the definition and then just look at the staple grain foods? But none of the studies did that. So this is actually even better news for the refined grains picture because it shows that even when you include all these indulgent grain foods, it still doesn't increase your risk. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know this is going to just sound shocking. The average person out there, the uh, clinician, a... uh, a dietitian, if you told them that eating muffins or donuts or brownies, sweet rolls and so forth, doesn't increase your risk of of diabetes, they would look at you uh, just in disbelief. And I can't tell you one way or another if that's true, because it could be that they do increase your risk, but the consumption of staple refined grain foods maybe offsets that risk. I just don't know. And none of the studies teased out the separate influences of those different types of grain foods. So that's a conundrum that needs to be resolved. Yeah, that hasn't been studied yet. And I wanted to mention, I did a podcast interview, episode 94, with Dr. Julie Miller-Jones, who's also on the Grain Foods Foundation Advisory Group. And I am excited to share that it's actually my most popular, most downloaded episode And we talked about whole grains versus refined grains. And, you know, she talks about the doodles, ding dongs and donuts. And it was a fun conversation. I encourage people to tune into that one if if you're interested in this topic. And we're going to talk about that more as well. But as a certified diabetes educator for 20 years, I have this firm belief that carbs, grains, sugar itself even does not, quote unquote, cause diabetes. But yeah, when you when you look a little deeper, it is interesting. Like we can't even say for sure, like there's nothing that shows that it does. But to your point, the sugary, more sweet, indulgent grains, it hasn't even been studied. So let me go back and, and say, and I know we're going to talk more about the research and grains in particular, but you talked about the strength of the meta-analyses and I'd like to just touch on briefly the limitations, because I do that a lot on the show, kind of looking at the whole picture. There's a lot of limitations just inherent in nutrition research to begin with. So could you just address some of those? Sure, I'd be glad to. And there is a lot of fuzziness in the nutrition research. As I mentioned, the strength of the meta-analysis is that it includes in the analysis uh, results from all relevant studies with regard to a specific topic. So that's viewed as a strength. Uh, One of the weaknesses, however, not just of meta-analyses, but the studies that are included in these meta-analyses that are of an observational nature. And I focused almost exclusively on observational studies, as did the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. They rely on typically self-report of food intake. So how accurate are they? not vary with regard to quantifying the amount of food individuals consume, they probably do a better job of getting a qualitative assessment of what people eat, quantitatively not so much. 
But another big problem is that they are typically only given out to the participants in these studies at the beginning. And the assumption is, is that that kind of window into dietary intake at that one point in time is consistent throughout the follow-up that may last 5 or 10, 20 years or so. And I think that's a huge leap of faith to think that that's true. So that is a major limitation to these kinds of studies. But I should point out the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, who issued a report in 2015 that I took issue with, they rely on pretty much the same kind of studies, these observational studies. And not only that, they relied on uh, observational studies that included just basically dietary pattern research. So that's even fuzzier because you don't know what one or more of the ingredients within a particular dietary pattern is the real culprit. In the Western dietary pattern, I'm quite convinced it's, it's largely due to the red and processed meat that is the main culprit there and possibly high fat dairy and french fries. I didn't do a complete analysis of all the individual components of the Western dietary pattern, but I did do some of it, and it looks like red and processed meat and perhaps sugar-sweetened foods and beverages present some of the problem with uh, that dietary pattern. So, you know, we still have, I think, a, a consensus that we can guess at this, but we're not quite sure. And I think we probably put a little too much faith in the uh, self-report information and these long-term follow-ups of people over time. I think they can kind of give us an idea, but it does not prove cause and effect. And I do want to make sure everyone knows that these observational studies do not show cause and effect or prove it. They just show whether there is or is not an association. All right. Thank you. You explained several important points. And yes, nutrition research is predominantly observational studies. Yes, we have randomized control trials, but the majority are epidemiologic observational studies. And, you know, it's sort of like the best science that we have to work from. And we mentioned dietary patterns versus food groups. So I want to talk a little bit about that and then get into the dietary guidelines a little bit more. And what comes to mind, you know, this whole dietary pattern approach is somewhat new. And just as an educator sitting here kind of pondering what you're saying, it seems to make sense to encourage certain types of dietary patterns. But you're making it very clear that when we look at research through dietary patterns, it just really gets fuzzy. And so it would make more sense to split those into specific food groups and then maybe even divide those food groups further, such as, you know, the refined and enriched grains versus the indulgent grains. So talk to me a little bit about that a little bit more with regard to research and recommendations about dietary patterns versus food groups. Sure. I understand the rationale for looking at dietary patterns because people do tend to be categorized into patterns of eating that would be you know, kind of broadly classified as an unhealthy type of pattern versus a healthy way of eating. So, for example, people who consume lots of whole grains also tend to be consumers of fruits and vegetables, and they also might be low consumers, basically, of, the, of red and processed meat and might avoid sugar-sweetened foods and beverages. So I understand that, that you can kind of broadly look at this in terms of patterns. And that's the way people eat, and I understand that. But from a scientific perspective, I want to know what is the problem. So, for example, if someone says eating hot dogs is bad for your health, I want to know, is it the hot dog or the bun? It may be, the good message would be just avoid eating hot dogs and don't ask any more questions. <laughs> but I like to ask questions about, like, what's the real problem there? And it looks like it's the hot dog and not the bun. And there's a, a nice parallel here with this low-carb craze that's kind of hit this country off and on over the last several decades, and it's been particularly prevalent in one form or another for the last couple decades, with this emphasis on carbs are bad and eating the meat is okay. So, over the last couple of decades, I've noticed at some restaurants, you can get these options for like, if you get a burger, you can get the burger, but instead you can avoid the bun and just put a lettuce wrap around it or some sort of other wrap because the thought is, is that the meat is okay. It's the bun that's bad. And the research actually shows just the opposite. You would be better off going into a restaurant and say, I'd like a hamburger, keep the burger, give me the bun. 
and uh, I'll be fine with that. That would be healthier for you. And yet we tend to do the opposite. So we are very mixed up in our country with regard to separating fact from fiction. And that's one of the reasons why I do deep dives into the literature like this, because I want to know what is the culprit. So, you know, if you have a, at a restaurant, you have a uh, E. coli breakout. Well, one, you can just close the restaurant and then be done with it. Or you could say, I want to know what food is in there that has the E. coli in it. Where is the source of this? And then correct the problem rather than just close down the restaurant. So I think there's a, a way to look at this globally and then more granularly to find out, like, what's the real problem? And that has been the pr- approach I've taken with the refined grains research. And it even gets more problematic because you'll I'll find people on one hand, particularly the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee in 2015, they stated in no uncertain terms, Americans would be far better off if they essentially replaced refined grains with whole grains because they're much better for you. The observational studies are quite clear. Whole grains are associated with reduced risk of a lot of these chronic diseases. But I also looked at all the randomized control trials that have actually compared head-to-head whole grains versus refined grains. And this basically avoids the problem of the observational research and not knowing basically whether or not people are adequately reporting what they eat and whether or not they keep with that over a period of time, years and years of follow-up. And what I found in my uh, analysis is that when you compare whole grains with refined grains head-to-head in randomized control trials where groups of people are basically assessed over uh, admittedly a short period of time, most of the studies are in the neighborhood of about one to four months, but their diets are changed so that they either replace refined grains with whole grains or they are kept on kind of a refined grain diet. So there's distinct differences in the dietary patterns with regard to refined and whole grain intake. So if you are of the belief that whole grains are far superior to refined grains, you would come to the conclusion beforehand, you would state your hypothesis that it's actually this is uh, unnecessary to even do. We know whole grains are better. But in almost all the studies that have been published, there's no difference. Mm -hmm. I looked at several meta-analyses. I think there were four that had been published up until the time I submitted the paper for publication. And they include dozens of studies that have been done over the years. And they looked at you know, your classic kind of risk markers for cardiovascular disease and diabetes, like glucose and insulin and cholesterol, triglycerides, blood pressure, and so forth. And in only one of the meta-analyses did I find that whole grains were favored over refined grains. In almost every single study, there was no benefit of the whole grains over refined. So that is a huge paradox and something that needs to be resolved because the observational studies show a clear benefit for whole grains, but the randomized control trials don't bear that out. And I don't know what to say about that. Well, yeah, it's very interesting. So this is this misguided guidance, Mm -hmm. you know, making half your grains whole, which, like I said, Dr. Julie Miller-Jones and I discussed at length in episode 94, even as a dietitian, I kind of found that to be a little oversimplified and perhaps even confusing. I like a play on words, but even that I felt was just a little too play on words, like half your grains whole, you know, it's, I don't know. And the implication being try to get more whole grains, right? But then it just kind of ignores what are the other half of your grains and the refined or the enriched grain messaging is sort of lost in the shuffle. Okay, in terms of messaging, uh, and I state this in the paper, if you're going to make a statement that is based solely on the available scientific evidence, I recommend that individuals make an attempt to increase whole grain consumption with no specific recommendations about changing refined grain consumption. So if you look at the literature on whole grains, It shows that when you go from virtually no whole grain intake down to about three servings a day, you get a huge reduction in risk associated with virtually all the chronic diseases we've been talking about, the diabetes and cardiovascular disease and so forth. And it's a clear dose-response relationship. So one is better than nothing, two is better than one, and three is better than two. Beyond that, the return on your investment becomes a little less clear 
Some studies show you can get even more benefit with going to four or five whole grain servings a day. Others tend to suggest that it might level off. But given the fact that the average American consumes right now less than one serving a day of whole grains, probably the best pragmatic approach would be, hey, just try to double that. Maybe go to two or three and you've done a good thing. But since the research does not indicate that refined grain intake is associated with any of these diseases we've been talking about, I don't know that we need to have a specific recommendation about reducing refined grain intake or make half your grain intake whole because it's kind of like, well, how many servings a day do I consume? I don't know. And how, you know, if I don't know how many total I have, how do I know what half is? Mm-hmm. So that's one of the problems I have with that. But it's clear cut that if you just look at where you can get whole grain foods, like in cereals and breads and pastas and so forth, you can look on the labels and see what a serving is and just up it by, you know, double it or triple it during the day and be done with it. That's it. I think that's a far simpler, less complicated recommendation than increase your whole grains to the point where it's at least half and ultimately maybe replace all of your refined grains with whole grains. That's not necessary and the research doesn't support it. As a matter of fact, you may actually be worse when you remove all refined grains from the diet. And the reason for that is because they are fortified and enriched. And sometimes to the point where you get actually more nutrient intake when you consume the refined grains. And I should point out that the average refined grain intake amongst Americans is, well, it depends upon age and sex and race and ethnicity, but it's somewhere between about maybe five to seven servings a day. And so that's considerably more servings than we get for whole grains. But you have to remember that refined grains are not devoid of nutrients. During the refining process, they don't take out every single last nutrient from the grain, the kernel at at all. So there's still some nutrients in there. As a matter of fact, the ratio of a lot of these goodies, the phytonutrients and so forth that we have in uh, whole grains maybe outnumber refined grains by about seven or eight to one. But if we consume so many more servings of refined grains, it's kind of a toss-up. As a matter of fact, grains themselves comprise more than half of all the fiber that Americans consume. And of the grain intake, uh, refined grain intake uh, contributes about two-thirds to three-fourths of the fiber in grains themselves. So the amount of fiber we get from refined grains in our diets is actually more than what we get from whole grains. So it's not a trivial amount. And so asking people to just not consume refined grains is not a good idea. Right. So if we cut out enriched grains, that could result in nutrient shortfalls. Refined grains have B vitamins, folic acid, thiamine, niacin, riboflavin, and iron, and to your point, the fiber. And uh, I believe that enriched grains are the largest contributor of folic acid in the diet, in the American diet. Mm -hmm. We know that we want to get more whole grains. And I really like your specific approach to, you know, most people are getting about one serving, you know, you can kind of look at your diet and, and figure out what you think you're getting on a daily basis. But try to, you know, up that by one or two servings, and maybe leaving the refined grains, the enriched grains, where they're at. And it seems intuitive to say, well, yes, you know, a a pasta is healthier than a donut. But to your point, the research hasn't looked at that. Yeah, not specifically. And I certainly don't want to give the message here that, hey, Uh, If refined grains aren't associated with poor health and donuts are included in there, I can make all my refined grains donuts. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying the research has failed to really distinguish very specifically the separate effects of some of the staple grain foods with the indulgent grain foods. So I think the best message here is that Right now, it looks like making conclusions about what we should or should not eat on the basis of dietary patterns is overly simplistic and may actually be deleterious if we remove all refined grains from our diet. But I think the best approach would be, hey, I can make some reasoned decisions about what to do here with grain intake. If refined grains don't appear to be associated with increased risk, then I don't have to worry about 
maybe cutting back on some of these uh, staple grain foods because let's face it over the last few decades maybe probably the most uh, the recent decade the last 10 years or so consumption patterns in the United States clearly show a decrease in for example bread consumption that is down and i don't think there's any scientific reason to support that there's no data really to suggest that bread intake is associated with increased risk of any of these chronic diseases. So there's no reason to cut back on breads. There's no reason to cut back on cereals and pastas. Now, certainly if an individual is consuming lots of these indulgent grain foods and they have some of these adverse health outcomes, they might want to take a look at their diet because I'm not saying that these kind of indulgent grain foods should be included equally with regard to the uh, health outcomes as, as we would the uh, staple grain foods. I think there is probably a difference there, but we just don't know scientifically how much of a difference there is. I would just say, you know, use some common sense here. And again, I like your approach that, okay, we don't need to worry about this as much as it seems like in the media. And, and again, I think this is one of the you know, inherent challenges in nutrition research and recommendations is really digging down to what the research says and trying to avoid oversimplifying that or, you know, spreading that out to the masses versus an individualized consult with a patient. With people with diabetes, we would say, okay, when you have the brown rice, how does that affect your blood sugar? When you have the white rice, how does that affect your blood sugar? When you have the donut, how does that affect your blood sugar? You know, we've got some more immediate tools to look at there. This begs the question for, you know, future research. Like what, if you could wave a magic wand, how would you like the future research to look when it comes to grains, refined grains, and chronic health conditions? Okay, on two fronts. One, future observational studies or ongoing observational studies that are looking at this should make a concerted effort to separate out the staple from the indulgent grain foods. That would be very important because you know, if you look at these scientific studies, they generally will have a form that goes something like this. A large cohort of people is identified. They're provided food frequency questionnaires to establish kind of their dietary patterns. And then in terms of outcome measures, you see figures or tables in the studies that are published years afterwards. And there'll be basically dis distinctions between whole grain foods and refined grain foods, and that's it. And as I mentioned before, within the refined grain foods, you have both the staple and indulgent. In some of the studies, they will separate out uh, some categories. I know not in the meta-analyses so much, although in a couple of them they did look separately at like bread intake. That has occurred, but not across all types of refined grains would they look at each of those separately. So to the extent possible, I think I would like to see that occur in observational studies. So we don't just have the staple and adulterate grains lumped into one category. On the front of randomized control trials, I would like to see better designed trials that go for longer periods of time and include more non-traditional types of outcomes and markers of health that are not necessarily included in the current studies. So when I mentioned the randomized control studies a few minutes ago, uh, most of them included your rather traditional risk markers such as fasting glucose and insulin and fasting blood lipids and your blood pressure and so forth. These are rather traditional biomarkers for cardiovascular health and diabetes risk. I would like to see more non-traditional types of measurements, inflammatory markers, markers of vascular health, the ability of the blood vessels to dilate and so forth these kinds of non-traditional risk markers. I would like to see more of that. And I would also like to see more work done in the terms of non-fasting values, like in the postprandial period. So when you mentioned just a few moments ago, treating this individually, like you have someone that might want to know how brown rice or white rice or some other food, a donut or something like that affects their blood sugar level, this is very important because we spend most of our time in a postprandial period. So, you know, we eat breakfast and lunch and dinner and we have snacks in between. 
And the eating patterns of the typical American are such that we're hardly ever in a true fasted state. So the importance of a fasted blood sample, for example, might not be nearly as informative as a non-fasting sample. And I think that is something that could be added to the studies with regard to the randomized control trials. Because there was one meta-analysis that showed a clear benefit for whole grains versus refined grains in postprandial blood values like glucose and insulin. So I would like to see more of that take place on, on the randomized control trial front. Excellent. You made a comment a while back about the diabetes and so forth and sugar and I think your son comment about yep. the diabetes risk uh, with sugar. You can actually go to the American Diabetes website and the American Diabetes Association website, it actually indicates, uh, you know, they have a bullet there on what is associated with or causes diabetes. And they have a bullet item there that says sugar does not cause diabetes. So I know it's kind of a knee-jerk reaction, like diabetes is a problem with blood sugar regulation. And people who have diabetes typically have elevated blood sugar, so consuming sugar would be the last thing they would want to do. And that may be true for some individuals after they've developed the disease, but it's not really a major contributor to developing diabetes in the first place. Right. We had been talking offline about, and I'm sure I've mentioned this on the show before, but yeah, my son, because I'm a diabetes educator, you know, he hears me talk about diabetes a lot. And uh, it, it really bothers him when, when he hears kids at school saying that sugar causes diabetes. And he recently had a project at school He's in fifth grade and the kids had to kind of do the research and some critical thinking on, well, when I say do the research, like look into the literature and do some critical thinking about whether they should keep flavored milk in schools or not. And it was a fun project. And my son had a little bit of an advantage with his mom being a dietitian and a diabetes educator oh. and... Fun side note, uh, one of the um, pieces in their curriculum, which turns out it's a national curriculum, is a chocolate milk video I did when I was with the Dairy Council about 10 years ago. And my daughter is actually in the video. She's she's in college now. But when the kids uh, saw that video and my son was like, that's my mom. Just a fun side note there. It was interesting. They had to write a letter to the principal and pull together all their research and their pros and cons and state their case. So yes, he, he does. He gets bent out of shape when he hears that sugar causes diabetes. Mm. But yeah, you know, to your point, it's important to look at what the research says. And we get into these food mantras and these kind of oversimplifications because, again, it's the best science that we have, but other times it's because we're not actually looking at the science. So Yeah, I know. It's common knowledge that carbs are kind of a cause of diabetes and it's something you should you know, avoid at all costs. But I was on the Dr. Oz show about six or seven years ago, and Oz and I had this little debate about carbs. And I said, actually, there's a lot of science to show that high carbohydrate intake, provided that it comes primarily from sources that are rich in cereal fiber, are associated with improvements in diabetes, and you can actually get people off their medications with this kind of dietary approach with just a very high carbohydrate intake as long as it's uh, complex carbs that are loaded with cereal fiber. And he seemed shocked at that, but you know, th this has been known for years. And another important point to make is that once you get diabetes, and one of the best ways to control it is not just through diet, but also with exercise, because the Tissues that are most resistant to the uh, insulin or skeletal muscle and exercise has a profound effect upon improving insulin sensitivity and therefore you can up your carb intake quite a bit if you're a really prolific exerciser. So that's part of the, I think, the thing that is missing in the, in the dialogue with health outcomes and diet. You have to consider the exercise as well. We don't get enough of that. Well, I'm glad you brought that into the discussion because you are an exercise physiologist and that's the background you come from. But certainly fitness and diet, exercise and diet, they kind of work together. So thanks for bringing that into the discussion as well. Is there anything else about this topic about refined grains and the bad rap they've gotten that you wanted to share this study that just came out? Is there anything else that you wanted to share about this that we didn't touch on yet? You know, the most important, I think, take-home message here is that prevailing evidence really indicates that notion that refined grains are, are bad for your health is 
more a uh, guilt by association with food items within a Western dietary pattern. They are the real culprits, not the refined grains. So I think that we need to just take a step back with regard to our current dietary guidelines in terms of recommendations and reassess this from the standpoint of the published scientific evidence. Yes, and I'll just add, you know, when we're looking at that Western diet, even something like red meat and processed meat, there's a lot that could be separated out with regard to that. I know that some of the the cancer discussions um, have talked about the research there and and kind of needing to do similar to what you're saying, you know, separate the indulgent grains from the staple grains, you know, separating out some of the processed meat and some of the other types of meat so that we have a better, more clear picture of where those associations are. Right. And that's a real problem, as we've been discussing with nutrition research, is that there are so many different foods and ways to prepare them and consume them that it's just almost an impossible task, really. You know, I'm an exercise physiologist, and I tease my nutrition colleagues a lot by saying, you know, it's easy for me to address the issue of exercise because, you know, a person goes into a fitness center and they have basically the following question, do I do cardio or do I do resistance? And that's you know pretty simplistic, but the choices are quite limited with regard to the exercise. With regard to nutrition, however, you go into a grocery store and there are tens of thousands of items you, know, you can choose from, same with restaurants. And so it's how to assess the health impact of the way we eat is exceedingly difficult. And I think we need to be careful about recommendations that are based upon science that is not all that solid. Right. And again, reinforcing the aspect of this is not just observational data primarily, but self-reported. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Anyone who's worked with patients, whether they've done research or not, they know that it's not necessarily that people aren't trying to tell the truth. You know, we have to rely on our memories. You know, in terms of general recommendations for dietary guidelines, I I don't think anyone is going to dispute a recommendation for more whole grain consumption. We don't consume enough whole grains. We need to consume more. End of story. I don't think anyone would dispute that. We also probably would benefit if we consume more fruits and vegetables. I think that's a good story to tell. And then it gets a little bit more complicated when you get into some of the other food groups. But as far as the refined grains go, I think that just became apparent to me that the evidence, and when we talked about diabetes, I could also, in the uh, review article, I go through the uh, case for coronary heart disease, and that's compelling as well. There were nine meta-analyses for coronary heart disease or vascular disease and stroke uh, as compared to only two for diabetes, and in the nine meta-analyses, they all show no association with refined grains in either vascular disease or stroke. So it basically just indicates that there is just nothing there with that. And I forgot to mention that total grain intake, when you look at both the uh, total grain intake from the standpoint of whole and refined, that's typically associated with reduced risk of a lot of the chronic diseases, particularly diabetes and all-cause mortality. So on the basis of that alone, I don't think we can make a recommendation that we need to consume fewer grains. I think overall, we need to look at balance also. I think so. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing this new research with us and walking us through the meta-analyses and what you found and for doing this work in the first place, for, for having this interest and sharing this out with us. For everybody listening, I will have more information on this topic on the show notes at soundbitesrd.com. I will have the press release and more information about the research study, as well as links to some infographics and some fact sheets from the Grain Foods Foundation. So be sure to check that out. And again, Dr. Gazer, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And as always, enjoy your food with health in mind, and a few more whole grains, and don't worry about those refined grains just as much. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke.